uh, welcome, first of all, on this uh, Startup Grind uh, talk, which is our second virtual Startup Grind talk, uh, which we have. And uh, before we welcome uh, our speaker on our stage, uh, we will say a few words about uh, uh, what we do and why we do it. Uh, maybe you know that uh, what we do is uh, we are passionate about helping entrepreneurs all around the world. And we started about 10 years ago in, uh, in Silicon Valley. And today we are in uh, 125 countries around the world. And our passion is really to help educate entrepreneurs. And this is one of the ways how we do it. And uh, we will start with uh, the fireside chat as was announced at, uh, in about 10 minutes. But before we do, uh, I would like to uh, tell you a bit more about a few of our activities. One of them is uh, something which we always try to do to push the bar, to make sure we can innovate enough. And since this situation is about, uh, uh, has changed dramatically, we would like to make sure we can be adjusted. And today for the first time, uh, it is our second uh, fight I chat virtually, but for the first time we'll be doing also virtual business networking. And for this, uh, I would like to welcome uh, Peter, our co-director, to tell us about uh, how we will do it after the fireside chat and what uh, you can expect. Peter? Hey, hi guys. Thank you all for coming. Um, for the very first time, we're gonna try something that we never tried before. And due to the situation we're in, we have to experiment and then innovate. So tonight we're gonna after the event, um, let's say from 9 to 9.30, we're going to start with uh, virtual networking. And we're going to use a platform that I'm just going to share in a, in a chat. Uh, it's called Remo. And the point here is once you join, it, it takes only uh, like 30 seconds to register. I would recommend you register with your Google account, which is much easier. Then you can uh, connect your LinkedIn if you want for other people to be able to connect with you. And then uh, we have something interesting. You will see that we have different tables with different topics from fashion, AI, deep tech, blockchain, product marketing, where you can just jump by double clicking on the tables and you can basically join the crew and just talk like you would talk normally in our networking part. And we, we also have corners with our sponsors and partners where you can jump and talk to Lois Silkin about legal things or we were clubs or someone from our team and i think hopefully that will be fun um and we will end up by kind of bringing everyone on the stage and seeing what's your experience so yeah hopefully you will stay after this talk and just switch to that link so i'll just share the link now in the in the description so hopefully you will i will see you there thank you marian before we have the, the talk with uh, with us i want to tell you a bit uh, a bit more about uh, how I actually found out about what an incredible person uh, and entrepreneur uh, Herman Hauser is. Uh, I actually first heard about him from uh, uh, a course which is at Stanford. It's called European Entrepreneurship. And it was about four or five years ago where I first saw him speak and I was totally, totally amazed. So uh, the audience, uh, we are very lucky because uh, from across the, the whole world, we have uh, our main hero for, for today, for tonight and for this morning in, uh, in New Zealand. Uh, without any further ado, uh, I would like to say only a few words about uh, our speaker, which I am very, very uh, excited to, to, to have on our stage. Uh, as a matter of fact, it took us uh, uh, a while to, to get uh, uh, Mr. Hauser on our stage because uh, he's super busy. And uh, to be honest, it's, uh, it took us about two years to of convincing and uh, today we are lucky because we can, we can speak. Uh, maybe, uh, maybe a bit of, of the background. Uh, it's, it's only if you really uh, investigate what happened with uh, Mr. Hauser uh, around his uh, innovation enterprises. And over the years he, he founded and co-founded over 20 companies. And, uh, uh, these companies, uh, you know, span across the deep tech industry. Uh, he has uh, several exits behind him, uh, uh, and exits which are super relevant, uh, like DNA sequencing company and uh, also a, a microchip company. 
And uh, Hermann is also a fellow of the Institute of Physics and uh, of the Royal Academy of Engineering and honorary fellow at the King's College in Cambridge. So uh, Hermann, uh, welcome, uh, welcome here. Uh, can you please tell us at the beginning, uh, how is the situation in New Zealand and uh, whether you are affected uh, uh, in a big way from, from the coronavirus? <clears throat> well, we are extremely lucky here in New Zealand uh, that uh, we have a, a very rational prime minister who's got the whole nation behind her. She came in uh, very hard, very early. So we have uh, 1,500 cases. Uh, and so far we have uh, 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 13 deaths. So New Zealand has really coped with the virus situation in an exemplary fashion. Uh, uh, <clears throat> the reason why I'm still in New Zealand is because my flight has been cancelled but I'm uh, back to Europe. But I don't mind at all because the background that you see here is, is my beach on my farm here. And this is probably as good an isolated place to weather the virus storm as any. Yes, it's, uh, <laughs> it's pretty amazing. So you are uh, lucky in, uh, in the unlucky situation. It's true that you know, the Prime Minister of New Zealand has been uh, grabbing some headlines uh, in, a, in a good way. Uh, Let's start with your entrepreneurship story because, as you know, you know, Startup Guy is, uh, is here to help entrepreneurs, especially the upcoming generation of entrepreneurs. And uh, I know that uh, your grandfather was an entrepreneur and, uh, uh, and he was an entrepreneur in the, uh, uh, in the early stages of entrepreneurship. Can you please share with us uh, uh, how, what was his story and what have you learned from, from the journey of your grandfather? Yes, he was, uh, <coughs> he was quite an amazing uh, person. <laughs> he actually uh, originally came from Czechia uh, and from Brno. And he walked uh, uh, from Brno to Vienna uh, with all his possessions in his rucksack. And <coughs> on, his, on his gravestone in Vienna, it says, uh, house owner and burger of Vienna, which were obviously the two things he wanted to achieve in his life. And what he, what he did is he started a, um, a, a belt factory. He produced the belts for the Industrial Revolution. So these were made out of cow hides. I still remember him cutting the cow hides into these strips and then uh, <coughs> you know, gluing the strips together for these belts. I don't know if you remember, but the factories in those days had these big steam engines. There was one engine, and then there was an axle along the top of the factory that had wheels and each of these wheels had to be connected down to the machines and he produced the belts that, <laughs> that did that. Oh, interesting. Uh, I would like to also give an opportunity to the audience to, uh, to jump in and uh, if you have any questions you can, uh, you can ask. All you have to do is, is very simple and uh, this is, you basically, if you see my screen, you just point your mobile phone on the screen and uh, a website will pop up uh, and uh, on the website you just type in your name and, and ask away. So whatever you want to you wanna ask from, uh, from our, our uh, speaker, uh, I promise the, the most interesting questions uh, we, will, we will ask and uh, which ones you can decide because we uh, have an option you can, you can like questions which, uh, which you prefer. So the most popular questions we'll, we'll take uh, throughout the talk and also at the end. So uh, feel free to use Slido. Now, uh, Herman, I know that you, uh, you are originally, you mentioned your grandfather is from Czechia, he came to Austria. Uh, how did you end up uh, leaving Austria? Why? And, and how did you end up uh, being uh, uh, in, in Cambridge? Uh, well, my <clears throat> uh, mother, who was Viennese, uh, married my father, who is Tyrolean, and we grew up in the Tyrol. And my father came back from Innsbruck, which is our capital, the capital of the Tyrol, uh, with, bro with language school brochures um, for uh, uh, learning English. And he said, boy, you're going to learn English. And I said, yes, father, as one did in those days. But why? <laughs> and he said, well, English is the most important language in the world. So you go and, uh, and learn English. <clears throat> and um, the, the, the final choice, uh, I had lots of language school brochures, was between Exeter and Cambridge. Now, I didn't know anything about Exeter, but I didn't know anything about Cambridge either. I didn't even know that there was a university there because, you know, I was 16 years old. Uh, but the train connections to Cambridge were better than the ones to Exeter. So that's how I ended up in Cambridge. And uh, so it's, now you're in Cambridge. And uh, 
what made you uh, decide to stay there and uh, and no, I, I, just, the... I just fell in love with Cambridge you know I was 16 years old it was the first time away from home uh, the language school was full of these wonderful uh, <coughs> Uh, Swedish girls that also learned English in those days. Uh, it, it was it was just a wonderful time. Mm -hmm. And uh, the best time I had was on the back lawn of King's College because the back lawn of King's College uh, <coughs> is the lawn that goes down to the river and all the, the people punked past, the, uh, uh, past that lawn. Uh, and in those days, everybody could still sit on the lawn. Unfortunately, now I'm a fellow of the King's College. I still can, but very few people can. <clears throat> and uh, you know when, when when the girls used to punt by and punting is actually not not that easy you've got to uh, you know have a bit of skill so I could always help them and uh, and that was uh, that was the reason why I then applied to King's College to to, to do physics. <laughs> mm -hmm. So you studied physics and uh, uh, then uh, at some point uh, I know that you you were thinking about uh, about AI uh, uh, or, or 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 physics uh, and you, you stuck with physics. How did you get from from uh, academia into entrepreneurship? What was the the first uh, real reason? Uh, yes, that's a, a a very good point. Um, when I was when I was about to finish my a PhD in physics, uh, it was really the first period when people got very very excited about artificial intelligence, and I got so excited about artificial intelligence that I actually wanted to change my PhD subject from physics to AI because uh, I was uh, convinced, as everybody else was, uh, that we were going to uh, build this uh, um, program that produces the world chess champion that October, so six months away. And we, we all thought, you know, we could do this. And I wanted to be part of that team that produced the, uh, the world chess champion. Now, it took another 20 years for this to happen. But <laughs> in those days, you know, it was very exciting. So in the end, I decided to finish my PhD and get my uh, get my PhD in physics just at the time when the first AI winter uh, broke. <clears throat> and then it became, it was actually the Lighthill report. He was a professor at Cambridge who said, well, this is, you know, a great vision, but there, there is no substance to it yet. There are no results. And although there was actually a lot of substance, because a lot of the ideas of machine learning, of uh, a language processing of, of, of thinking about uh, these, these things were already there, but there were no results uh, because the computers weren't big enough, uh, the, the algorithms weren't really sophisticated enough yet. Um, but as Jeff Hinton uh, points out, the, the one big missing uh, component that really made AI finally make uh, uh, worked so well was the big databases. We didn't have any of these big databases. So instead of doing AI, uh, I got involved in um, starting a company called Acom Computers, uh, which <laughs> interestingly, as its first objective uh, uh, in life was microprocessors. We, we never dreamt that we would produce the most successful microprocessor in the world at the time. Uh, we just got so excited about microprocessors because uh, there was a community called the Microprocessor Group at the university. Uh, for the first time, uh, there was the opportunity to actually build your own computers uh, because these microprocessors were cheap enough that you could buy them and you can build a little home computer kit, which lots of people did. And that was actually our first product. We produced uh, the Acorn System 1, as it uh, became known, which was a home computer kit that uh, people would solder together and uh, program in, in hexadecimal code. Yes. There's an interesting story about, uh, about uh, Acorn and the BBC. And uh, when I heard, I was really impressed about how you pushed the team. Can you please share with us uh, what happened and why did you decide to go against uh, uh, the possible and, and make sure your team did the impossible then? Yes, that is quite a, a story. In fact, I just uh, read um, part of a, a book that is about to come out uh, about this time and how we got the BBC contract. Because the BBC, in its wisdom, and it was an amazing uh, project, uh, had produced a, um, a program uh, that was called When the Chips Are Down. And this, this uh, program mesmerized the country because it painted a picture where every household would have one of these chips. And what they meant by the chip was a microprocessor. 
and they uh, they painted this picture that you know microprocessors would do all kinds of things for you and everybody got very excited about it and then the bbc decided well the only way to really educate the the, the nation about uh, this this coming revolution this microprocessor revolution is to produce a program which was called the computer program and then they decided the program wasn't good enough they really had to have a computer to go with the program so that people could actually uh, program themselves they could find out for themselves what this uh, this revolution in microprocessors is going to be about and they they decided to use a a, a government organization because they didn't want to give it to a uh, a commercial company uh, called newbury laboratories which was owned by the government to produce this computer and they worked with them for two years and uh, it still didn't work so they decided they, they had enough uh, of this uh, uh, project and they uh, went out to six companies at the time, including Sinclair and Acorn Computers, uh, to see uh, if there is a commercial organization that could do this better than the government. And they saw us on a, on a Monday with a specification that had everything in the kitchen sink in it. I mean, it was one of those in the BBC visions that this computer had to do everything, you know, graphics, color, uh, networking, uh, basic, uh, BBC basic, as it turns out, uh, probably the best basic in the world, as it, as it finally turned out. And it went to the six companies. And, and Sinclair at that time was very, very arrogant and said, uh, <clears throat> forget about the specification. The only computer that makes any sense for me is the Sinclair Spectrum is my new computer. And that's the one that you have to use. Now, we had a different approach. We looked at their specification and realized that Steve Ferber, one of our brilliant designers, who then was one of the two designers of the ARM processor, uh, had a design in his head, which actually was very similar to what they wanted. And then, and this is uh, you know, quite, a, quite a story which you can see in a, in a film that was made called Microman. Uh, we actually produced this, um, uh, this computer in, in uh, four days and three nights. So when wow. they came back, on uh, on a on the Friday, uh, there's a little detail that's worth uh, pointing out. <laughs> it was two o'clock in the morning. We'd worked all day, all night. Uh, the computer still didn't work. Uh, I was the one. <clears throat> I wasn't really clever to to do the uh, all the hard work, but I I I made the tea and produced the food, you know, and encouraged everybody to keep going. And at two o'clock in the morning. I changed from the tea lady to the hotshot designer that really I am, you know, I told them the reason why this doesn't work is that there was this umbilical cord between the, uh, <coughs> the computer and the development system that we had. And that, uh, that wire produced a clock skew. And I said, guys, what we're going to do is we're going to cut that umbilical cord. We're going to blow the program into the ROM and we'll make it work all on itself. It's going to work. And they said, you're crazy. Uh, you know, this is, this is never going to work. And they did it and they did. <laughs> so, so they oh. never forgave me for the fact that oh. I actually made uh, so it. So BBC became, be a, became a customer of the program? Um, BBC became a customer of, uh, of so this? Uh, the, 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 so they arrived, they, they saw that there, there was a working computer one week after they told us what they wanted, which was incredible. quite different from the two years that they worked with uh, at Newbury Laboratories. So they yeah. gave us the contract. And what the contract meant is that we produced the computer, uh, we manufactured it, we delivered it, uh, we had to pay the BBC a royalty uh, for uh, advertising and marketing. So we had a, the best marketing machine in, in Britain at the time because we had these, these programs uh, that went out every week. Uh, there were in, in the end, there were 30 different programs. And this was another thing that's sort of difficult to understand now. Uh, as you know, people like going to pubs in the UK at six o'clock when the computer program was on, they all went home from the pub to watch the computer program. I mean, it was a national uh, you know, event. Uh, <clears throat> people really wanted to find out what these computers were all about. So it was a great success and the company went from zero to a hundred million um, uh, pounds in just uh, five years. And uh, it's the only company that I know of uh, that had a capital gain of a million fold. So every pound we put in was worth a million pounds when we went public. So you invested 200 pounds into the company, right? That's right. <laughs>
and the IPO even public, and it was uh, even public and for public, about two hundred. US as it was called, the unlisted securities market. And uh, at that time, it was the, the the most successful company in Britain. There wasn't a company in Britain that had ever gone from zero to a hundred million pounds in five years. And and we were the I sort of was the Steve Jobs of uh, of Britain. Uh, unfortunately, that didn't last for very long because we had some serious uh, financial uh, problems uh -huh. with the, the Electron, which was our next entry. Yes. What is worth mentioning also, you also have a story about how, uh, how Bill Gates uh, uh, wanted to meet you and convince you to, to work with MS-DOS, uh, right? Yes, yes, yes. And he didn't he want to. to. Why, why is that? Uh, well, he came out to see me with his photographer because he wanted to be in the same picture with me. Uh, and um, um, I think at, at that time I was probably richer than he was. Things have changed a bit. Uh, and we could, we could sit him down. Uh, and the, the only program he actually produced himself uh, was Microsoft Basic. And it was, it was quite a good Basic, but we could sit him. Uh, Roger Wilson, who, who wrote BBC Basic, of course, was very keen to show off BBC Basic to him uh, because it actually was a lot better than <laughs> Microsoft Basic. And he was impressed by that. And then I said, Bill, uh, we also can, um, uh, everything uh, here is uh, networked. And when you are a boy or a little girl at, in a British school, you can type in, I am Johnny. And then you're connected to the local file server, to the local area network through the Econet, which we uh, produced. And then you can use the same commands to download everything over the network and use the network. And Bill's response to that was, what's a network? <laughs> so we were way ahead in, in many of the, uh, the things. And uh, on MS-DOS, he was very keen to sell me MS-DOS. But again, I could show him uh, these um, <clears throat> operating system functions that MS-DOS didn't have at the time. And I said, uh, Bill, we couldn't possibly take such a retrograde step. You know, we're way ahead in, in operating system. Now, uh, he did catch up and produce an operating system, which, of course, uh, now is, is dominant in the PC business. So Acorn was, was really ahead of time. Now, of, out of Acorn, several companies uh, were, were born and spun off. And uh, one of them is uh, uh, the most successful licensing company in the world, uh, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, That's uh, Arm. Can you tell us about how Arm was born and uh, uh, what did you want, you to, want to achieve with, with this company? Well... Since microprocessors were sort of part of our DNA right the at the beginning, uh, and we used the 65 for two for the BBC microcomputer, which is the same was the same 8-bit microprocessor that was used in the Apple II, and uh, but 8-bit uh, microprocessors really ran out of steam. They ran out of address space. You couldn't have more than uh, 64 kilobytes of RAM. Uh, they ran out of, of power because 8-bits uh, wasn't really enough for the new powerful applications and games that we wanted to run. So we looked at every 16-bit and 32-bit uh, computer at the time, including the 8286 from Intel. And we finally decided that maybe we wanted to use the 8286. So we went to Intel and said, look, your, your microprocessor looks quite a, like quite a good microprocessor. It just screwed up the pinout because you put both the address and the data bus on the same pins. Nobody can make a a, a really fast, a good computer out of that. So, but if you sell us just the die, we'll do our own pinout. So maybe we could make something of your chip. And Intel said, you know, little Cambridge company said, they get lost, you know. So we said, well, you get lost, we'll do our own. So that was the only reason why the arm exists. Uh, we finally decided we had to do our own microprocessor because there wasn't one in the market that was good enough. Now, then there was a spectacular piece of luck that exactly at that time, uh, Stanford and Berkeley in particular invented a new microprocessor architecture called RISC, Reduced Instruction Set Computers. And this is one of the few cases where a new <coughs> idea appeared in America, <coughs> in Stanford and in, uh, in Berkeley, <coughs> but it was first implemented in Europe. So we had the first implementation of that RISC idea, the first commercial implementation of that RISC idea. And because it was a reduced instruction set computer, it was so simple that a small company like Acorn could actually produce it. Now, we had two geniuses uh, with um, Roger Wilson and uh, now Sophie Wilson uh, after her uh, change, gender change, and uh, Steve Ferber, 
uh, who uh, is also the, <laughs> the other story I always tell is I gave two big advantages to that design team that neither Intel or AMD or National Semiconductor managed to give to their design team. And the two advantages were first, <clears throat> I gave them no money because we didn't have any. And the second big advantage was I gave them no people. So the only way they could do it, this is the only microprocessor that was designed by two people, just two people. Uh, and then of course the, the detailed design was done by a bigger group, but the, the conception of the, the instruction set uh, was done by uh, Sophie Wilson and the, impl the um, chip implementation was done by Steve Ferber. Yes, I happen to be actually, uh, funny enough, on, on an advisory board of the same company, Steve Ferber. Uh, he's a legendary uh, uh, ch ch architect of, of, uh, of chips. Also, you know, working on the uh, human brain projects and some, some exciting things uh, as well. Exciting. And uh, one of the companies which was also coming out of, of ARM, which uh, uh, I'm super excited about, uh, which you did, what you did there, because it was uh, an exceptional example of, uh, of scaling up uh, and using the, uh, the, the Moore's Law. Uh, and the company is called Solexa, which you then eventually end, ended up uh, selling for uh, 600 million. Can you please tell us about uh, uh, th th how hard it was at the time to, to do this, this business? Because DNA sequencing was very hard and it was uh, yes. assumed very often to be impossible uh, for the next yes. few years. And yes. Can you please tell well, us uh, how did it change? Well, <clears throat> very early on, although my, my a PhD was in physics, um, you can't live in Cambridge, and especially uh, in King's College, without being exposed to life sciences. Uh, uh, you know, life, life sciences, we've, we've got uh, lots of, uh, of course, famous people like uh, Crick and Watson, who actually uh, <coughs> deciphered the structure of DNA in the Cavendish Laboratory, which is the physics laboratory, which is where, where I did my PhD. So they did the DNA research, actually about 100, uh, no, about 20 meters from where I did my PhD, there was the crystallography department where they, where they uh, <clears throat> deciphered the DNA. So I've always had this, uh, this interest in DNA and life sciences and lots of discussions, of course, were also about DNA. And then <clears throat> uh, Fred Sanger, who is also a <clears throat> honorary fellow of King's College, and, then, and one of the very few people who got two Nobel Prizes, and uh, one he got for the uh, Sanger sequencing, which is, uh, uh, the, was, was the standard at the time on how you, how you did uh, DNA sequencing. But then there were two professors at the um, uh, chemistry laboratory uh, <clears throat> uh, that was Shankar Balasupramanian and uh, David Kleneman, who in a pub, as, as the story goes, had this idea of <clears throat> doing sequencing by synthesis. So, um, uh, you basically take one strand and then, uh, as you know, the double helix is double stranded and then you put one uh, nucleotide after the other to complete the second strand. And as you put the nucleotide on it, it had a little fluorophore tag and you could actually look at it with a, microso a microscope and see the color of the fluorophore. And there were four colors for the four uh, DNA. Th and that's, uh, uh, that's how this DNA sequencing worked. And it was a very difficult company to get right because, uh, you know, you had to have very high resolution microscopy. You, you're looking at, uh, at, at fluorophores and so on. And you said uh, we finally had a brilliant uh, CEO called uh, John West. And this is another key uh, ingredient for uh, the success of Selects or any, any company, of course, is the, is the CEO. And uh, we clearly had... Our, outstanding technology there so we needed an outstanding ceo so we started the ceo search and we said we need somebody who really understands the market but also understands the technology so that they can do that and we went through a whole list of candidates and then there was this guy john west and john west ran the one billion dollar division of abi that had a 90 percent market share of all the dna sequencing in the world so we went to see John and said, John, we've got good news and we've got bad news. <clears throat> the <clears throat> bad news is that we've got this new uh, sequencing machine here uh, that will blow you out of the water. 
the good news is we want you to do it. <laughs> and he said, well, let me have a look at this. So he came to Cambridge. He's a, a, a physics uh, a graduate of MIT. So he understood the physics. He understood that this was really revolutionary and was actually at that time already 100 times better than the machine that he was selling. And it was quite an extraordinary uh, you know, jump from the uh, Singer sequencing to the sequencing by synthesis. And uh, something that is so difficult to understand in Europe, he left his $1 billion job, uh, you know, very well paid, very secure, to join a little startup in Cambridge. Uh, you know, this is, this is unusual. It's and of course- Good convincing skills. Yeah, and he, he, he made a fantastic success of it. We sold it for over 600 million. As it, with hindsight, this was the biggest mistake in my life because that company now is worth 40 billion. So, oh, wow. and 75% and of the sale of Illumina, which is the company that we sold it to, uh, is our sequencing machine, uh, which of course is still all produced in Cambridge. So the entire technology of the, the 40 billion uh, revenue is still uh, Cambridge technology and is still being developed uh, in Cambridge. Okay, so this is enough you know, for, for, for lifetime, but you, you, uh, you, you kept going. Next business, which, uh, which also you, you've been associated with, is uh, a company called Cambridge Silicon Radio, which you ended up uh, selling for two and a half billion to, to Qualcomm, uh, which is a Bluetooth company. Uh, can you tell us what was the, the reason why uh, there was a need for a company like that? Oh, that's another uh, amazing story. Uh, you're, you're actually reminding me of, uh, of really quite a few interesting things that I've done in my life. I haven't thought about this for a while. So. Um, there was this group, uh, we, Cambridge has one very unusual aspect, which is four world-class consultancies. And the number one of the four is Cambridge consultants that I've been working with very closely. I've just recently done a, actually uh, a, a DNA synthesis company with them called Egonetics, which we can talk about later on. But at that time, a group from Cambridge consultants came to me and said they want to do uh, a Bluetooth chip. And I said, uh, well, <clears throat> uh, Bluetooth is, is a standard and all the, and all the, uh, uh, the patents are held by Ericsson. Uh, why do you think you could uh, make inroads in the technology? And they said, well, we are going to produce the first single chip Bluetooth device where both the radio and the processor the, the, um, is, is on the same chip. Uh, so I said, well, you know, this is difficult because Ericsson is a very substantial company and probably the best radio company in the world. Why do you think you can beat Ericsson uh, at their own game? And they said, well, because we've already done it at uh, 500 megahertz and we just now need to do it at 2.4 gigahertz. And uh, the one thing that maybe I've learned uh, over the many years that I've been doing this is I can recognize a five-star wizard when I see one. <clears throat> And James Collier, who was the leader of that group, clearly was a five-star wizard. It's actually quite difficult to uh, recognize five-star wizards because they don't have five-star wizard written on their forehead. And if they do and they tell you, they normally aren't a five-star wizard. So, but this was just an exceptionally gifted uh, group. So <clears throat> I then said, well, I better do some due diligence uh, because this is a chip. Of course, I, I talked to my uh, Silicon Valley guys <clears throat> whether they think um, this is a sensible project. And they all said, ah, yes, single chip Bluetooth. Yes, we've been, we've been thinking about this uh, for many years. Uh, don't touch it with a parch bowl. This cannot be done. Walk away from that deal. This is a bad deal. <laughs> so encouraged by this news, I invested. And <clears throat> so what I had to believe is that they will beat the uh, most uh, important, best funded, uh, radio company in the world, which was Ericsson. I had to believe uh, that they could do something with which Silicon Valley couldn't do, and that they could do it at a price uh, that would uh, uh, make it successful in the market. And the reason why it was so hard is uh, that the Bluetooth radio is a, has to listen out for this faint signal at 2.4 uh, um, gigahertz at the same time as having the baseband processor, which is a clocked device, clocking on the same uh, piece of silicon as the radio. 
So it creates this tremendous interference because every time the clock goes up, it, it creates a, a, you know, a, a tremendous uh, electromagnetic wave. But they had a very clever way of doing it and, and, and they succeeded and they became basically the standard in uh, audio headsets like the, the one that you have at the moment, uh, Marian probably has, we have a 90% market share in Bluetooth in, in headsets, so it probably has a, uh, <coughs> a CSR, a Bluetooth chip in it. That's a very good story. Uh, I want to touch upon, upon two things which you did uh, before we take some questions from the audience. One thing is, I don't think you get enough credit for uh, doing something which I think influenced the entire UK economy, which is creating this network of catapults, this uh, uh, technology transfer uh, uh, organizations. Can you please tell us about uh, what was the, the problem there and, uh, and why did you feel it's so important for the economy? Uh, well, Britain, as you know, has uh, an exceptionally uh, good uh, university system. Britain is the only uh, country outside the US that has four uh, universities in the top 10 uh, in the world all the time, uh, Cambridge, Oxford, uh, UCL and Imperial College. But the speed and the efficiency with which uh, Britain can translate its research results into successful companies uh, lags way behind uh, the US and in many ways also way behind Germany. And the reason why Germany is doing a lot better in the actual translation are uh, a uh, <clears throat> chain of Fraunhofer uh, Institutes, Fraunhofer Gesellschaft. And uh, uh, Peter Mandelson asked me if uh, we could take some of the ideas from the Fraunhofer Gesellschaft and translate it into a, a British context and have the equivalent, uh, uh, which then finally became the uh, catapult center, to act as a sort of stepping stone from research to an intermediate institution, uh, which is half research, half industry, uh, so as to translate this into uh, industrial products. And uh, although some of the things I took from the Fraunhofer Gesellschaft, in particular the, uh, the funding uh, key, which is a third from government, a third from industry and a third from projects, uh, mainly EU projects, which uh, I hope will continue because I hope Britain will uh, remain part of uh, Horizon Europe. Uh, so let's switch gears a little bit and uh, talk about your investing career because you've been close to very interesting companies and uh, uh, there is a pattern there. Uh, you decided to create, to, to start uh, uh, Amadeus Capital Partners. Oh, I assume it wasn't very hard for you to raise your first, first fund, was it? Uh, well, I wouldn't say it was easy because uh, venture capital, this was the very early days of, uh, of venture capital. This was in, in 1997. And um, I suppose the, the reason why I was keen to start a venture fund is because uh, I was probably at that time 50% of the business angel money in Cambridge. Uh, so I had this fantastic deal flow uh, because people knew that if they had a really exciting technical idea, uh, I was a sucker for these technologies and they'll get some money from me. So I had a deal flow that I just couldn't deal with anymore. Uh, and then <clears throat> uh, I met uh, Anne Glover, my partner in Amadeus, and uh, she wasn't easy to convince uh, that, uh, that I'm serious about starting a venture fund. Um, until uh, Bill Gates and Nathan Merwald uh, wanted to set up a Microsoft Research Lab in Cambridge. And Nathan came to see me and said, uh, Herman, we'd like to set up this research lab, but we wouldn't do it without your permission. I said, Nathan, you're Microsoft. You can do whatever you like at any time, but it do not need my permission. But if you want to do it, you know, I'm very happy to uh, support that and, and back that. And this was the first big company that I then uh, brought to Cambridge. <laughs> and then uh, I've also been involved in getting Apple to Cambridge through selling him a Cambridge company, getting Amazon to Cambridge, selling him another Cambridge company. Uh, so uh, uh, I'm, I'm very proud that we've had this relationship with large uh, uh, American companies. Uh, and then uh, uh, Bill said, uh, look, um, we want to set up this research lab, but we also want to do something for the Cambridge community. So uh, we would like to, you to run a Microsoft Venture Fund. And I said, no, I'm not interested in a tethered fund, but you can invest, can invest in our new fund, uh, Amadeus Capital Partners. 
and they so they became a cornerstone investor in, in Amadeus, and then it was easy to raise the rest of the money. Oh, interesting. So I didn't know that. So uh, tell us a bit more about Amadeus. Uh, so I assume you you like to go into deep tech uh, uh, founders and invest in these companies. Uh, what is the thesis of of Amadeus? Well, it is really deep tech. Uh, so um, and we have uh, there there are four. Uh, technologies that I believe will change our lives in the next five to 10 years, uh, not 10 to 30 years. And these four are obviously AI and machine learning. Everybody now knows that this is a, a really just a, an extraordinary horizontal technology that touches all the different uh, sectors. Uh, but they, you need to have specialist, uh, specialized versions of machine learning for, for different sections. Uh, that's number one. Uh, number two, <clears throat> is synthetic biology. I do believe that synthetic biology and gene, uh, um, gene synthesis will be a bigger and more important market than gene sequencing. Because with gene synthesis, we basically take control of the, of the building blocks of life. And that is the reason why I started Evonetics with uh, Cambridge consultants and actually the old, uh, some of the old uh, Selexa team. Uh, the third one is blockchain and smart contracts. Blockchain got this terrible uh, image because of uh, uh, you know the cryptocurrencies and the uh, bitcoins, which are a wild a wild west uh, solution. <clears throat> but it is my belief that uh, once we sort out uh, KYC, know your customer, and AML, um, anti money laundering, and automate that, and make uh, the blockchain uh, you know a very safe uh, environment. The benefits of blockchain is particular with smart contracts, uh, which allow business processes to be automated, are one of the four uh, technologies that I believe uh, you know, are really going to have a, a big impact, uh, not just on finance and insurance, but also on real estate and, and many other sectors of the economy. I agree. As, a, you, as an infrastructure, they'll be biggest. Um, as an infrastructure layer, sure, yes. Do you also, so you already invested in some, in some blockchain companies? Yes, we have, uh, but we're still really we have a, 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 an insurance company called Block Claim, uh, which is uh, you know quite exciting uh, dealing with uh, insurance claims uh, very efficiently. But uh, we we keep looking for the for the ones with uh, with smart contracts and uh, uh, and I think it's 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 uh, it's about to happen. I think there are a number of uh, really exciting. Uh, companies we're evaluating at the moment. And the fourth technology uh, I should uh, mention, which is very important, is uh, quantum computing. And as a physicist, I've been excited about quantum computing for a very long time, uh, but we all thought it was like fusion, that it's almost 30 years away and 30 years later, it's still 30 years away. But about five years ago, it became clear that quantum computing is going to work. And its, uh, it's uh, power is enormous because uh, the performance of a quantum computer goes exponentially uh, with the number of qubits rather than linear with the number of bits like in a quantum com in a classical computer. Uh, that's true. And what kind of what is the size of the deals which you you sh you like to 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 go into into these deals? Is it Series A, Series B, or, or also some early stage like like seed stage? Well, we we uh, have, we even have. Uh, what we call proof of concept uh, deals for 50,000 pounds just to uh, get people going. <clears throat> so we even do a uh, pre-seed, but the main uh, investments is uh, series A and series B. Mm -hmm. So okay. uh, anything from um, you know, 50,000 up to about 5 million. I understand. So let's look at some questions from the audience. Uh, we have uh, quite a lot of people watching this, uh, this live stream. Uh, There's a question here from, from Johnny Seaman. Uh, in a time of uncertainty, which industries or opportunities are you most excited about at the moment? Uh, well, there are so many uh, solutions uh, that uh, we're looking at for the COVID. So, so one of the things that I do is I, uh, I chair the European Innovation Council High Level Group, and now I'm vice chair, and we've, we, we just started a COVID um, uh, call We've had the most fantastic response. We had 4,000 uh, projects, and we're, we're probably going to fund about 40 or 50 of them. And they are just full of good ideas. And one of the, uh, one of the best ideas I've come across is just uh, random testing of the entire population. You know, Paul Romer has done the, the sums on that. He's a Nobel laureate in, in economics. 
and realized that if you test about 7% of the population every day, mm -hmm. <clears throat> then you can, uh, you can go, you can continue, uh, you don't need any isolation, you, you just can continue uh, doing what you're doing because you just track down, you're absolutely, uh, you know, dedicated to find uh, people that have COVID, completely isolate them and track down everybody they've been in contact with. Now, this would require uh, ramping up the, uh, the testing uh, from, you know, the, the sort of 10,000 tests that we do uh, at the moment to, well, in America, about 20 million a day. So the question is, uh, you know, this clearly is a solution. Uh, <clears throat> can this be done technically? And then uh, Roma makes the, uh, the, the key argument that the damage that this is doing to the economy is measured in the trillions. So what if we took 100 billion and tried to solve this problem? So he went and talked to the people, say, can you ramp up testing to 20 million a day for 100 billion? And he said, absolutely. For 100 billion, we can, we, we can do it with a few hundred million. We don't need 100 billion. But nobody is taking that obvious solution. So it is, it is really surprising that in, in a crisis situation like that, when there are actually solutions that you can do for 100 or 200 million, and the benefit that you would have is close to a trillion, why are, isn't anybody bold enough to do this? And it's a great uh, question. Are, and course, and you having... Course, our politicians, if I can just <laughs> add that. Uh, politicians in the West, as opposed to the politicians in the East, who are raw engineers, are, uh, you know, well, in the case of, uh, of the US, of completely un uneducated uh, uh, people who, uh, <clears throat> who don't understand this at all, and in the case of the UK, an innumerate classicist. <laughs> mm -hmm. can, can you please, uh, like, what do you think about, uh, what's the reason behind uh, why did it take us by such a big surprise you know there's a virus so we know how to respond to a virus why yes, are there no no procedures in place which we can follow why was it such a big surprise to the whole world economy it wasn't a big surprise to the world economy it was a big surprise to the arrogant west especially the americans and and the brits uh, and, and Europe uh, as well, but uh, uh, sadly UK, which I have a you know, very soft spot for, uh, and that has become my, my second home. Uh, <clears throat> it, they just did not believe that anybody in Asia of these developing countries, these inferior uh, uh, people, uh, could have the solution to the problem. Look at Taiwan. Taiwan never had to have uh, isolated. They have, uh, I think, 10 deaths or something. Uh, because yeah. they knew the problem. They went through SARS, they went through MERS, they knew this was serious. The minute this uh, appeared, they shut, uh, they, 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 they had, they didn't shut anything down. They <clears throat> just followed every single COVID case. They, they tracked every single person that they were in contact with and they isolated them. This is not rocket science. This is something that was known. And the arrogant West, just ignored the fact to listen to the people who actually knew how to do this. That is correct. And uh, you having the head of, uh, of, of the chair of the European Innovation Council, uh, how do you think the Europe can really keep uh, being at the front of innovation globally? Because the competition is very big. You know, we have uh, these clusters yes. of innovation in countries like China, uh, not just the US. What do you think uh, does Europe need to do in order to stay, stay ahead? Well, I think this, in my opinion, this is the biggest uh, uh, challenge that we have in Europe, because uh, if we don't respond to this innovation challenge, uh, the Americans and now the Chinese uh, are going to have our lunch. Uh, you know, uh, <clears throat> and the reason for that is that these four technologies that I talked about uh, will have such a fundamental impact on the productivity of our economies and our our ability to, uh, to innovate, that those that take these opportunities and turn them into successful solutions uh, will grow their economies uh, and will grow their living standards and those that don't uh, will fall behind. Mm -hmm. And the reason why Europe is in such a tight spot is because the amount of money that we put into innovation, into translating our research results. Now, if you look at our universities in Europe, 
they're just as good as not better than American universities or Chinese universities if you look at the number of, uh, of startups that we produce in Europe. We produce more startups than the US. People don't know this uh, so much. So we don't have, we don't have an R&D problem and we don't have a startup problem. We have a scale-up problem. Uh, if you look at the amount of money uh, that we spend on these technologies, it is a factor of five less than the US uh, in terms of venture capital. And uh, a similar ratio is true for uh, Europe compared with China, where a lot of the money doesn't come from Chinese venture capital, but from the Chinese state, uh, in particular in key technologies like AI, uh, like quantum computing. Uh, uh, China is putting an enormous amount uh, of money and effort into this. And in terms of the engineers that they produce, of course, they now produce many more engineers than uh, the US and Europe uh, taken together. So we, we have a, uh, uh, an imperative to do something about it. Now, the European Innovation Council will be 10 billion, we hope, when the budget will finally be passed. Uh, and, we hope, and we've structured it in such a way that this can be equity. Most of this will be equity investment. Uh, but uh, my recommendation, which was uh, accepted, was very much that this the 10 billion will be used to crowd in another 30 to 50 billion. So we will only invest as a catalyst for the market. So most of the money has to come from the market. What the EIC can do together with the ERC, the European Research Council, uh, which is one of the most successful European uh, initiatives we've ever had, um, can give the sort of seal of technical uh, uh, excellence. So, uh, and hopefully a catalyze and crowd in the, uh, the market to make this happen. Okay, that's a very good answer. Uh, looking at Slido again, uh, there's a question from Alice. Uh, Alice wants to know, what is the most important piece of advice you would give uh, for leading and setting up your senior team to succeed? Uh, well, <clears throat> It has to be well balanced. Uh, you have to have uh, somebody who's got the leadership quality to lead and inspire the team. You've got to have uh, somebody uh, with the technical excellence uh, to produce a product that is clearly better than the competition. And you have to have a sales organization that can then uh, proselytize that uh, to the market. Uh, and so the, the, the most important thing is to cover all the basic uh, functions uh, in, in the company and build a coherent team uh, that, uh, you know, likes working with each other and, um, and gets on with it. Maybe a quick question for me uh, regarding Amadeus and you mentioned the, the issue of scale. Uh, how, how does Amadeus, after you invest in a company, how do you help your companies uh, uh, scale up? Well, one of the key... <laughs> I always, uh, you know, people always uh, uh, say, what <clears throat> should a venture capital company provide apart from money? And I think there are two main things uh, that uh, a good venture capital company should provide. One is make the network work for the company. So because, uh, you know, we know most people in a particular sector that we're active, uh, we can help with um, recruitment. We can help with... Uh, partnerships, we can help introducing companies to uh, large companies because often we uh, invest together with corporate uh, venture capital. So that's one, making that network uh, work for the companies. And the second one is helping with the, um, with the business model. Uh, a, a team, uh, uh, a particular founder team, has to get the business model uh, uh, right just once. Now, <clears throat> And then, and then they're done. Uh, as a venture capital a company, we've got to, we see these business models every time. So we're not, not any smarter than the, the people in the company. We just have done it so much more often. And getting the business model right is sometimes just as important as getting the technology right. And ARM, of course, is a, is a classic example. Who would have thought that a little Cambridge company would beat uh, Intel at the microprocessor game? I mean, I, I don't know if you looked at the numbers recently, but Intel, in terms of microprocessors, is actually a niche player in our market. Uh, we produce 20 times more microprocessors a year than Intel. So Intel has a 5% market share in our market. <laughs> yeah. And that's because that's of the licensing. That's incredible. Uh, 
uh, to add to that, there's also a question from uh, uh, from Guy Shackleton uh, here on Slido uh, regarding the, the scale up. In your opinion, what is the most common challenge today uh, that inhibits su the success of textile businesses? Well, it's money. Uh, you know, uh, it's getting better. Uh, uh, I mean, we can put these uh, big brands together in Europe as well. We've just raised uh, now 400 million for um, Graphcore, which is this new uh, chip company mm -hmm. uh, that at the moment uh, actually is the uh, is the largest chip in the world. I always uh, carry one with me because I'm so proud of it. <laughs> it is the it has more right. transistors on the chip. Uh, than any other uh, logic chip in the world, and it has That's the highest chip, right? it, It's it's That's, the uh, yeah. microprocessor for uh, artificial intelligence for machine learning. Yeah, it's a Bristol-based company. It's a team that I'm I, I've backed for the third time, and in order to be a uh, 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 and the the, the, the previous time, uh, this is actually a very little known uh, uh, processor called FirePath. Have you ever heard of the FirePath? Yes, of course. Oh, you're, you're, yeah, if you're one of the few. Well, the FirePath is a chip that actually 80% uh, of the people in the world use every day. Uh, it's, yeah. it, it's, uh, uh, it's the chip that uh, uh, <clears throat> is in the um, central office for your home broadband. And it's a, a, a Broadcom chip now because we sold it to Broadcom. So, so this team, I knew that this team was uh, you know, outstanding and produces chips that uh, were right first time. And this one, again, was... Uh, right the first time but then in order to be a global player in the in this very hot ai market you've got to raise hundreds of millions now in this particular case we managed to do this but this is uh, unfortunately still the exception rather than the rule in europe the americans do it in silicon valley all the time the chinese do it uh, all the time and in europe which is to, to need to do it much more often yeah, so it's funding uh last question from slido is from victoria uh, she wants to know are you still angel investing? And if so, in what industries? And what are the top three qualities you look for in founders? Right. Uh, yes, as I already said, uh, we are practically angel investors at Amadeus with our uh, uh, <coughs> um, proof of concept uh, uh, investments of just uh, 50,000 pounds. And in Austria, I'm a sort of personal uh, a business angel. I've made over 20 investments in Austria just to help the Austrian uh, community because I am Austrian and I, I feel that I want to give something back and I'm doing it together with my cousins in Innsbruck. I've got uh, uh, you know, a very large family. I've got 22 cousins, two of which have been with me in Cambridge for a while. So, uh, And that's, uh, that's going very well. What am I looking for? Well, I'm looking for uh, the, the number one thing I'm looking for is passion. You know, does the, does the team have this passion for wanting to do uh, that project that they, that they are totally convinced is going to be an exciting and important project? And if they have this passion, they can normally find a team around them that share that passion. And then, then together they, they can do things that you, you, you wouldn't believe could be done. That's, that's amazing. Uh, Herman, I think this was an amazing talk. I'm so, so happy you, you came and, and shared with us your, your precious time. Uh, it's very inspiring. And uh, so we'll be having now, uh, uh, this talk uh, is recorded, so people will be able to see it for, for, the, for the weeks and months to come. Uh, thanks for coming. Can you please tell us if somebody wants to uh, get in touch with Amadeus or send you something, what's the best way to, to contact you or your team? Well, email. Uh, <coughs> My email is actually on, on the website, so you can send uh, uh, email directly to me or uh, any of my partners in, uh, in Amadeus. If you have an interesting project, we'd be happy to look at it. Yes. Thank you so much for uh, talking to us. Uh, thank you so much for doing so much for the European innovation. Uh, and uh, enjoy New Zealand, and hopefully you'll, we'll see you back in the UK soon. Well, I'm looking forward to it, and thank you very much for the opportunity to talk to you. Thank you for speaking to us.